everyone, or good afternoon, depending where you are in Canada. My name is Keith Thompson, and I'm the CEO of a donor motivation program. And I'd really like to thank you for jumping on this 30 minute campfire chat and to initiate our actual third season of campfire chats. Uh, we have our illustrious leader, Ruth McKenzie from the Canadian Association of Gift Planners. Ruth, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Keith. This is going to be uh, really fun. Absolutely. And I think yeah. one of the reasons why we're actually having a third season is because when we initiated these in the depths of COVID back in 2020, um, we didn't really know what was going on. And so we thought at DMP, it wouldn't be great to, to interview leaders in the plan giving community about their thoughts of how they have changed uh, operations with their organizations. And I think with your perspective as president of CAGP, you have a unique perspective to share with everyone that's watching. And I think that's one of the reasons why these campfire chats have been so, so successful because they're so relevant uh, and they're only 30 minutes. Let's be frank, 30 minutes is a good yeah. period of time. Absolutely. We've also got in the habit of starting each one of these uh, campfire chats talking about our signature cocktails. Now I know <laughs> it's Eastern Standard Time, 11 o'clock in Ottawa, 11 o'clock in Toronto, but we would be remiss if we didn't share our cocktails. So Ruth, why don't you uh, let everyone know what you're imbibing in this morning? Well, you know, I'm glad you you uh, you mentioned the time zone. And, you know, in, in light of Serena, you know, actually being on the CAGP board and other board members who might be listening, you know, and we're talking about leadership. So the team at CAGP as well. I just want to be clear. I don't normally drink at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> But you know, I'm 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 also not going to go so far as to mix a virgin cocktail. That would just be completely ridiculous. But so today I am having a um, a fully um, loaded bloody Caesar because you know I wanted to make sure that I get all of the food groups in in play. So you know, there's some clam juice in the cocktail. So there's some protein as well as some some bacon and a shrimp and then some vegetables with a, a celery and a, a pickled onion and a little and a little uh, pickle over there. So, you know, it, it's a delicious, delicious cocktail and I highly recommend it. So I'm excited to be sharing this with everyone today and I look forward to our conversation as well as to the nap that I will probably need <laughs> afterwards, thanks to this. Well, thank you very and, you know, much. I just want to remind everyone, Keith, you know, because there's an evolution here and so when we first did this in 2020, I had I had created a new cocktail called the Pivot, which was the, you know, kind of the word of the day, um, and that was a tequila-based cocktail. And then last year, I also created a, a, a cocktail called the DMP, which stood for for Do More Philanthropy, and that was a gin-based cocktail. And so this is vodka-based. And I think next year we'll have to go with something built around bourbon, but we'll definitely have to switch to a five o'clock Eastern time frame for that, for sure. So, well, I think speaking for everyone who's participating today, we are riveted to in anticipation to hear what your next cocktail will be next year. <laughs> for me, my cocktail is a little more boring, but it actually is one of the top three cocktails in the world. Uh, it was invented in 1919 by Count Negroni in Florence, Italy, and I have it right here. It's a combination of gin, sweet vermouth, and Campari, but I would be remiss if I didn't also say it also has a orange rind, which is key for the flavor, and equally important from my perspective, it has one big ice cube. I don't know if you can see it, but that one big ice cube is critical for me because if you have a lot of crushed ice, Ruth, as you can appreciate, it just leaks into the drink and, and not, sort of negates the flavor profile. It, it works in a Caesar, definitely not in a Negroni. But Absolutely. Keith, I also, I just, I, I want to remind you, you, you pointed out yesterday that it would be a perfectly sculpted orange rind as well, which I thought yeah. was a really nice, a nice touch. Yeah, I find my, my underage daughter actually makes the perfect Negroni. I don't know if I, that it's legal or not, but just on our household, and she is the perfect orange grind manufacturer. So um, I think I'll save this till after 12 o'clock. Uh, yeah, we're going kind of hard early in the morning. And just yeah. again, for the disclaimer, we do not plan to drink these right away. It would make for a very interesting uh, campfire chat. 
So exactly. enough of the cocktails. Exactly. Not, enough of the cocktails. Let's get into the meat of the conversation. So much has changed in the last almost three years since COVID started. It's changed for every industry in Canada and around the world, but it has especially changed for our plan giving community in Canada. And uh, Ruth, you, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, given your unique position as a leader of CAGP, I'm wondering if you could just share with our friends who have tuned in, how exactly has your leadership changed during COVID or has it changed? Uh, you know, that's such a great question, Keith. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I can say that my leadership has changed, um, but I think I realized it's about being more intentional about articulating what I believe in, in, in terms of leadership. And, and so just being really out there that I believe openness and transparency are really key aspects of leadership, as well as authenticity. And I think this was a key one during a, a period of COVID, but balancing between being a strong and decisive leader, which is really important, but also showing some fallibility and vulnerability. I, I don't necessarily think that's a weakness. And uh, I think at a time when um, people have been struggling, I think it's on some level important to let people know that you have your times as a leader when you struggle too. And I think, you know, actively seeking advice um, and as a way of genuinely connecting with people, um, I think has been really important. And, you know, things like creating room for people to bring their whole self to the table. It's been a tough time. Um, so it's been really, really important, I think. And I, I don't know if I would have articulated this before, but, you know, during the pandemic and certainly after to, to really articulate that it's important to lead with kindness and values, to check in with people, remember that everyone has their own personal circumstances and to make room for that, whether it's because they've got kids at home or they've got mental health struggles or whether in your job you traveled all the time and now you're stuck at home and um, you know how that creates a new normal that is sometimes difficult. But I think, um, you know, and you had asked me about maybe a couple of aha moments. And I think one thing I would say is really articulating uh, that leadership is a verb. It's not a noun. Um, if you approach leadership as a noun, it's all about your title and it's about your job. But as a verb, it's about actively demonstrating yourself through what you do and, and the action you take. So it's, it's a result of living the traits of your organization and your organization's values and being inspired by what drives your organization's work. So those are a few things that came to mind for me as I pondered leadership um, as we were getting ready for this conversation. What about you? What came up for you? You lead an organization too. Yeah, well, my organization is much smaller than yours, uh, Ruth, uh, but I, I think the most important thing for me is to lead with integrity, uh, to uh, do what you say. Yeah. Um, I, I think more than, I mean, even as a, anyone who's a parent uh, knows that uh, children actually pay a lot more attention to what you do than what you say. Uh, and I, I think that lesson in leadership as a parenting style holds very much true in our roles in the plan giving community, which we all have a certain degree of leadership capacity or leadership roles. So I think we just have to act out of integrity and be transparent. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, um, being vulnerable, being open and honest, because I mean, I mean, the challenge with being a leader is that people sometimes don't uh, push back when they, when they disagree with you. And I, I, oh. I love getting constructive criticism. And I think, making sure that everyone knows that you're open to that uh, is, is extremely important, especially during these times where we're working remotely um, a, lot of the, a lot of the time. And that brings me to yeah. a, another point. I mean, with Zoom, with everything online, there's been so many advantages. We, it's actually enabled us to get through this pandemic. I don't know what we would have done 10 years with the extent of technology where it was back then. But there are a number of downsides. And, and I, I, I've experienced this personally in my life where my work life has bled into my personal life yeah. and vice versa, my personal life has bled into my work life. 
And sometimes it's hard to turn the off switch on or the on switch off, if you know what I'm saying. Have you Definitely. experienced that in your role and, and how have you dealt with it? And how, how do you help your, your people that look to you for leadership deal with that issue as well? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a tough one. And uh, I think it's one I, I talk about a lot with my team that, and we, we kind of started to refer to it as this, this culture of overwork that I think is pervasive in our sector. And, and I would go so far as to say how much, so many people get a sense of value out of how busy they are and how overworked they are. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm going to say right out, I'm, I'm kind of guilty of it myself. I'm, I'm, it's not really, I think one of my strengths that dividing the, the work and home and having that balance work. Um, and I think this comes back to working and having small kids where you kind of need work and life to be integrated, um, to have that flexibility as a parent and, and working full time. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not really, I'm not super good at it, but I do try and talk about it with my team a lot and how can we put strategies in place to have more life work balance and that's I'm using that term intentionally life work balance not work life balance because I think if we um, you know are strong in our life overall we'll be stronger in our work life um, so I, I try and kind of frame it that way but you know, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of talk these days about workforce issues and labor shortages. We talk a lot about millennials and what they want and what they're willing to do and what they and that they don't want to work the same way as us boomers have for many years and that we need to adapt in order to attract that workforce of the future. But and, and I think that's great and valid. But I also think that bilateralness is important as well. It can't all be about what the employee wants. Um, and, but I think as employers, we have, and as leaders, we have an inherent role to make sure that work feeds you and feeds our team. Um, there's a lot of talk out there about this four day work week. Um, and I, I'm not sure what that really looks like. How can you, is it just about packing 40 hours of work in 32 hours? I don't think so. Um, in an organization like CAGP, does that mean we have to staff up 20% to continue to meet our objectives? Probably don't have capacity to do that. So, so what does that mean? And I'm not sure for me that I, I deviate towards that four day work week, but I do really want to find ways to make work more manageable and, and dismantle that culture of overwork and create a less, a less hectic pace and to build in the important thinking time, you can be thoughtful and strategic and have an opportunity individually and collectively as a team to generate new ideas. So I, I think that's where I'm, I'm leaning as a team. Um, I, I, again, I push a, the team a lot with that, you know, think about, you know, creating some time in your calendar to do some important professional development reading or take a webinar that is not necessarily connected to work, but which is going to build you as a professional and as an employee uh, to create that space for continuous learning. I, and ultimately, I think that helps mitigate boredom. And as you would know, boredom is just a slippery slope to deterioration in the, in the quality of work. So I think those are important things to keep in mind. I certainly don't have all the answers, but, you know, again, this is where my leadership um, comes in of not coming to the table thinking I have all the answers, but talk to the team about how can we collectively address this issue and recognize that it it is a problem and what do we need to do to to mitigate that at CAGP. And a, and a related question would be, uh, it's a little tactical, but I know this is a question that is on everyone's mind when it comes to being in the office live or sort of logging in virtually online or, or um, Slack or, or uh, text or email or, or Zoom. Do you have any rule of thumbs that are working for you as far as bringing people back to the office? And in, in my case, we've kind of settled into a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the office live and then virtual Thursday, Friday. And of course, there are exceptions to that rule. And, and I'd like to think our team is, is flexible around that. But I hear so many stories where especially younger um, 
key employees are very reluctant to now come back to the office, which, I mean, being an old guy, I have some strong opinions that they're, they're sort of derailing their career and, and, they're, and they're not o- opening themselves to mentorship by, by resisting coming back. But I'd just love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a unique case at CAGP because half of our staff doesn't work in an office anyway. They work out of home offices. And Mm. so one thing I would say for us at the beginning of the pandemic is it really improved our team dynamic by everybody being virtual. Um, We had about half of our team in Ottawa and the other half in Ottawa and Montreal. And we would have our weekly team meetings but they were in in in-person team meetings in the office and others called in. Um, And I think it created a really unequal playing field um, that the the people calling in were not there quite at the same level as other other employees who worked in the office every day. Um, And we always had some room to work from home anyway, even pre-pandemic to that, you know, I, I think people like that generally. So for us, it was, it did a lot to kind of, like build our team on a more even basis. So I think that was really good. And then we talked about, okay, you know, what about going back to an office? Everybody is liking working at home or are really productive working at home. Coincidentally, the lease for our office was coming up. Um, I think it was August 20, October, 2021. And it's like, what do we want to do? Do we want to not have an office at all? Or do we want to you know, have an office and look at going back to office or some kind of a hybrid. And I think I, I decided, and we talked about it as a team, particularly those of us in, in Ottawa, but I wasn't quite ready to make the leap to no office whatsoever. And part of the reason for that, Keith, was that I'm just not prepared to shut out a whole segment of potential workforce for whom working at home is just not possible. Not everybody has the privilege of having a home office where they can create a separate space. I, during the pandemic, I talked to colleagues who were working off the, the, um, their kitchen counter um, or they're coming back, um, they're working through the day and they've got kids coming home from school midday and there's no privacy. So I, I think there's a, a privilege thing about working at home um, that we need to recognize and I wasn't really quite ready to make that leap. So we talked about continuing to have an office. Well, I don't want to pay for an office and not have anybody ever work in it. And so I think we kind of agreed as a team, we'll go in two, three days a week. Sometimes we schedule it so that we're there together or some of us are. Um, And sometimes we're just in there alone. And I personally uh, really like that as well. For me, just kind of changing an environment and looking out the window and seeing something different than I see in my home office is really, really nice. And I think a lot of people say, yeah, I don't really feel like going into the office in the morning, Uh, but once I'm there, I really like it. Um, So that's kind of fun. Yeah, it's gonna be very interesting to see how this plays out over the next few Mm -hmm. years. I mean, honestly, I don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. I don't know what those answers are. Uh, I think every organization and every individual has to customize their experience yeah. in virtual and and live. We'll we'll see. It'll be be fascinating to find out what what pl- yeah. plays out over the time. Yeah, I mean, I you know, one example I was doing a hiring a year or so ago, and you know, completely fine with working at home, but the job did require somebody coming into the office at least one day every couple of weeks. There was a piece of mm-hmm. their work that required that. And I had a couple of people ask the question and said, you know, that's the way it is. And they were saying, sorry, not interested. Even at one day, mm. every couple of weeks, they weren't willing to, to go that far. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. A, a, a related subject, uh, we've just come off, or actually not just come off because it was in April, the CAGP conference in Halifax, which I think was from my perspective, uh, a resounding success, especially since it was so great to get people together after two years of COVID. But there's many people wondering, um, live or virtual donor events, or um, can you do a hybrid event? And I know we've talked (laughs) about, because I know some people did want a hybrid event for the CAGP conference in Halifax. Um, Could you share your thoughts on, on what you think we'll be doing with that on a go forward basis when it comes to 
our donors, will we go hybrid and live at the same time, one or the other individual times? What, what's your perspective? You know, it, it's uh, the whole hybrid thing is, is really interesting. And, um, you know, maybe that'll be the name of my next cocktail, the hybrid, because I like to give them apt, apt names. But I think it's a little bit of a myth that you can do a hybrid event. I think um, you end up not doing either the in-person or the virtual component very well, unless you want to invest in it. And, you know, it, it's not just we're putting on a conference. Can you offer a hybrid element of it? If you want to create um, a solid hybrid event where people can be engaged and, you know, kind of emulate on some level an in-person experience and an ability to connect in a meaningful way with other delegates at the conference, um, that's a lot of work. And I think we did it really, really well at our 2021 conference. And um, I think a lot, number of people told us it was the best virtual conference they'd been at. And so the next year when people said, can we do the hybrid? It's like, it, that's organizing two conferences. Um, so do we have the market to um, deliver two conferences? You know, probably not. Do we have the resources, human or financial? to create two separate conferences because you know you need double the staff power you need double the technology all of those things so i i think it's a bit of a myth this whole hybrid thing and and i would say even i'd go so far as saying a, a, just a regular old meeting when you've got a bunch of people in person and a bunch of people there virtually it, it's just not really a great experience you either you end up you know kind of forgetting the people who are um, in Zoom and at your meeting, and it's harder to, you know, just kind of connect um, around the room. People in the room end up connecting in a better way than those who are sitting on their own in their in their own space. So I don't think it works for for events or for just general meetings. So, but that said, you know, there I think um, we switched obviously everything to virtual during the pandemic and. I think we learned a lot and we um, did some some really great things virtually. I think our um, Paul, our, our, as everyone knows, our VP education, as well as our education committee with our amazing volunteers came up with some great ideas to connect in a meaningful way at a hybrid event where they would have previously been very high touch in-person events. So we did things like, instead of just offering a course as a, as a one-off, um, we maybe offered it over two or three segments and maybe gave the uh, participants a little bit of homework in between them where they could work as a group. So we tried to do some things like that. And I think it, it worked really, really well in many cases. Um, I think uh, the ability for people who live in rural and remote communities to connect through learn to learning opportunities, obviously in a, in a virtual context that makes it much more, um, much more feasible. Um, you know, will we return to in-person events? Absolutely. There's, you know, you can't replace it. I mean, even at, at a committee level, you know, committees that meet all the time virtually just to get together once every couple of years creates a stronger connection that you can then carry back into a stronger virtual event after that. But I, you know, I think there's definitely a lot of what's called Zoom fatigue right now. Um, I know we have seen our webinar numbers drop um, in this past year um, from what they were the previous year. Now, you know, 2020, 2021, I would say the numbers were a bit inflated in terms of our webinars and courses that we offered online, but everybody was doing everything virtually. It was all, the, all that was available. So we've seen them drop off, you know, probably closer to what our numbers were like in in 2019. So I think there will always be a room for virtual, but um, I think, uh, you know, a blend of different formats versus blending the different formats together um, is a different thing. Yeah, I think that the blend is a, is a critical point. I was listening to Fraser Green. Uh, he did a CAGP webinar a week ago or two weeks ago, and he has some great data to support actually what you're saying he suggested that one, um, we always thought in the plan giving community that a plan gift actually only happened until there was a live conversation between the donor and the plan giving professional. 
he's feeling now with what he's seeing, that's no longer the case uh, because oh. older donors, baby boomers are very comfortable with technology and you have to communicate with them in the way they wanna be communicated. So right. on a go forward basis, you're gonna have donors that quite frankly, they're never gonna come back to a live event, never. You're gonna have right. donors that will only go to live events and you'll yeah. have some that will do both. But yeah. I agree with you at Donor Motivation Program, we've been asked to consider doing a hybrid event, but that is the very definition in my mind of multitasking. Um, and yeah. Present to a live audience and a virtual audience at the same time, it's kind mm -hmm. of like trying to design a dog cat. Either you have a dog yeah. or a cat, but it's very difficult to do both. So what we're recommending on a go forward basis, and this touches on what you said, Ruth, is that we'll have a hybrid initiative, but the hybrid means we'll do live events for people that want to come out to live events. We'll also do hybrid, we'll do online events for people yeah. that want to check out what you have to say online, but we won't both, we won't do them together unless I am persuaded or we see the data yeah. that it makes a tremendous amount of sense to do just that. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Completely agree. And, and for what it's worth, if you, if you log on to, um, to Fraser Green's organization, Good Works, he's just released uh, these special reports, which talks about what's happened during the pandemic, what has changed. Um, I'm not getting a kickback from Fraser, but Good Works does fantastic they work do. in the Canadian market. So much of what we see has an American accent. This is all Canadian data. Yeah. I would very much encourage you to go to Good Works and download those special reports. You'll find them really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, they do great work at Good Works. So we're, we're coming quickly to the conclusion of our chat. I, I, Ruth, I could I spend time talking to you for hours and hours, notwithstanding that it's uh, before 12 o'clock and I've got a, a drink to imbibe. Is there <laughs> any organization or individual, uh, and just very quickly that, and I haven't asked you this before, that stands out has done a spectacular job during pandemic over the last almost three years. I mean, I'm putting you on the spot there, but mm. the way they've um, changed and pivoted and, and is there, can you think of anything off the top of your head? I know I'm putting you on the spot a bit. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure that I can, I can speak necessarily to an organization, but I think I can kind of mention a particular leader that I think has um, been really innovative and that's your friend and mine, Malcolm Berry at the BC mm. Children's Hospital Foundation. And some of what Malcolm has done in terms of really um, um, succinctly framing the need for organizational culture to be strong, particularly during a pandemic um, and when people are working remotely and not connecting in that face-to-face, -face, it's really, really important to have that strong organizational culture in place. And so I've thought a lot about that based on, you know, Malcolm's, Malcolm's leadership and, you know, the friendship that we have in him as a mentor in many ways. Um, and that really stands out for me as an important approach to ensuring a strong and connected staff team which ultimately means, you know, if, if culture is about behavior and behavior is about results, um, then culture is about results and making sure that as a team, you're all connected around the why of what you do, your mission, and um, how that makes you get out of bed in the morning and drives you to bring your best selves to work. So that would be something that I mentioned that's had a lot of influence on me this last couple of years. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. And, and I have to raise the flag for CAGP because I think your organization, our organization during COVID, the amount of content, original and interesting and, and insightful, helpful content that was pushed out over the last two and a half years was phenomenal. And then you did the virtual conference um, and then we went back to live. So your ability uh, as an organization and as a leader to adapt to the last 24, 36 months has been really phenomenal. And I wanna thank you, Ruth, and everyone that works at CAGP because I think most of us on this call, on this Zoom meeting would agree that you guys have just done a phenomenal job. That's so kind of you to say, I, I really appreciate it, Keith. And of course, I'd, I'd be remiss in not saying that a lot of that's been possible because of the CAGP Foundation, which you've been um, a really seminal part of and 
so much of what CAGP has been able to do is because of the generous donors to the CAGP Foundation, you among them. So thank you and thank you to all of our all of our donors at the CAGP Foundation. And of course, I'd be even more remiss if I didn't mention the fabulous staff team we have at CAGP and the leadership of our board of directors. So, uh, you know, thank you for all you do. And thank you for the to the donor motivation program. You've been such an incredible partner. Um, and as advisors have been real leaders in philanthropy, and uh, it's just such a privilege to work with with you and Serena and, and all of you on, on the donor motivation program team. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. And for all of you that tuned in today, we so appreciate what you do trying to make the world a better place in your individual communities. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our next campfire chat is November 17th with Brad Willems who is our donor motivation program plan giving professional in Abbotsford in the lower mainland in beautiful British Columbia. He will be facilitating that campfire chat at 11 o'clock Pacific time, which I believe is two o'clock uh, Eastern standard time. If my memory serves, if my notes are correct, <laughs> so hopefully you'll uh, tune into that. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us for the last 30 plus minutes. Uh, we appreciate your time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.